All right, now Jeremiah gets really personal. So let's turn to chapter 20. And passages like this, I think, are helpful for those of us who are preparing for ministry, our future ministry, are currently in ministry, um, because this is where ministry gets a little bit raw. And uh, we have uh, evidence here in terms of some of the narrative. Chapter 20, so beginning in verse 1. So he has a conflict now with the priest. He only knew it was coming because of all the things that he's been saying on the streets. When Pasher the priest, the son of Emir, who was chief officer in the house of the Lord, heard Jeremiah prophesying these things, Pasher had Jeremiah prophet beaten. He put him in the stocks that were at the upper Benjamin gate, which was by the house of the Lord. Then it came about on the next day when Pasher released Jeremiah from the stocks that Jeremiah said to him, Pasher is not the name the Lord has called you, but rather Magor Misavav, Misaviv, I'm sorry, which uh, translated means terror on every side. For thus the Lord God, behold, I'm going to make you a terror to yourself and to all your friends. So you, he's not winning friends and influencing people here, Jeremiah. He's like what we saw with Amos in his encounter with the high priest Amaziah. He's not backing down at all on his message. But unfortunately... We're going to see Jeremiah is starting to feel the weight of the message that he's been given and the ministry that he's been called to. Here's a classic example in his complaint. Look down at verse 7. Jeremiah is going to say, O Lord, thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. Thou hast overcome me, and I prevailed. I have I've become a laughing stock all day long. Everyone mocks me. For, for each time I speak, I cry aloud. I proclaim violence. And destruction, because for me, the word of the Lord has resulted in reproach and derision all day long. But if I say, I will not remember him or speak any more in his name, then in my heart it becomes like a burning fire, shut up in my bones, and I am weary of holding it in. I cannot endure it. Remember that, that uh, bubbling forth idea. For I have heard the whispering of many, tear on every side, denounce him, yes, denounce him. All my trusted friends watching for my fall say, perhaps, quote, he will be deceived so that we may prevail against him and take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me like a dread champion. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble and, and, and will not prevail. They will be utterly ashamed because they have failed with an everlasting disgrace that will not be forgotten. Oh, yet, O oh Lord of hosts, thou who dost test the righteous, who seest the mind and the heart, let me see thy vengeance on them. For to thee I have set forth my cause. Sing to the Lord, praise to the Lord, for he has delivered the soul of the needy one from the hand of the evildoers. You see how it gets turned around? I mean, that's a raw prayer right there, right out of the quiet time journal of the prophet Jeremiah. He goes from pouring out his heart, being open and honest before the Lord, spelling out his case before the Lord, and that he remembers the Lord and perhaps goes back to the day of his call. He says, I'm, I'm in it for the long haul, Lord. You're my dread champion. You'll have your, those, those enemies of mine. I know, Lord, you'll have the final word. You'll have the final word in this situation where there's injustice. And I, I'm, I've gone from being in the stockades just around the corner, being thrown into the bottom of a cistern with very little water. These are the kinds of things that are happening. Have, have any of you ever experienced this in ministry? This is the kind of thing that can happen where maybe uh, we're in ministry. Oh, here come the, the remarks down here I just saw. This idea, if you're in ministry and you're doing the job and you're doing the what you've been called to do and preaching the message and preaching the word and all of a sudden you've got your, your antagonistic corner starting to rumble, you know, and you've got the people who are talking about you behind your back and trying to uh, get you thrown out. I have, I'll tell you this story. I probably won't finish Jeremiah tonight. That's okay. So when I was, uh, I left my uh, ministry post in Lafayette. That's the story where I had to resign. So I went over to another small farming town in Archbold, Ohio. And what I didn't know is that one of the students there named Nate, who had been, before I even got there and interviewed, he says, I, he swore to the youth group, because I was still in youth ministry. 
he swore and vowed to all of the kids in the youth group, whoever the church brings in to take over for the last guy that left, I will run him out of town in less than a year. That was his, as a freshman in high school, this was his, his primary objective. So we got to town, and, and um, Alan and I just had our son James, and we were planting ourselves, and he lived in the fishbowl just out of, out, of the, out in the middle of the country, and everybody would drive by and wave and all that. It was that, that kind of place. And it was, you know, not long. You know, you do the typical things in, in youth group. You take your kids on mission trips, and sometimes we took them up to northern Michigan to ski, and it was Nate that had smuggled in the whiskey with his friends one night and you know they slept in the next morning and we're a little bit groggy and we figured out what had happened it was Nate who when we went to the Dominican Republic uh, when we were coming back through customs leaving the country Nate had tried to smuggle a machete <laughs> in his carry-on bag <laughs> onto the plane and we barely got the youth group back into the country on time to make our flight. But um, what's interesting is, I, I mean, I was there. I mean, it was that in Archibald where I got, kind of got my attention. So why don't you go back to seminary for a while? And that's when I made my transition to move to southern Indiana and go back and get my MDiv, my official seminary training, after being in ministry for almost 11 years. So we were down in New Albany, and I was in the middle of my MDiv. And I remember it was like yesterday. Ellen came out of the kitchen. He said, Oh, yeah, um, got a phone call. Um, she handed me the phone. And I said, hello, Greg here. And in a kind of a, a, kind of a nervous voice, it was, uh, Mr. Smith, th th this is Nate? This is like three years later. Yeah, I just calling, um, well, I, I know, I, you don't know probably what I'm doing now, but I actually, I'm calling you from Minnesota at such and such Bible college, um, I'm preparing for the ministry. I'm in a, in a program, and I'm, I'm hoping to be a pastor someday. And something happened in chapel this week, and, and the Lord got my attention, and I just needed to call you. The Lord led me to call you to basically say and apologize for all the mean things that I did to you when I was a student under your youth ministry in Archibald. Will you forgive me? Nate calls me out of the blue. Of course, you know what I did. I hung up the phone, <laughs> walked away, you know. <laughs> Throw it on the ground, you know. No. I said, man, Nate, that's awesome, you know. We talked for a little bit and caught up, and it's obviously the Lord had gotten a hold of this guy. What did they say about pastors' kids? And in, in his case, his, his parents were missionaries before they had moved back to Archibald. So he had a heavy dose of you know, ministry and parents that were in ministry and all that and kind of rebelled against that for a while, but then the Lord got his attention and brought him back. So total transformation. And I think he's doing great now serving in ministry as a pastor. So anyway, so I didn't pray like Jeremiah for vengeance on my enemies, although I probably felt it. Another thing that they did to me in Archibald, I had a mailbox that I was so proud of, and it was, uh, I'd bought it brand new. It was one of those Molded plastic uniform designs that you get at Home Depot. You know, those real nice, big, oversized. Well, what I didn't, didn't know is these kids in the country like to, to take, and they go out and call it, uh, what, you know, you take a baseball bat and you smash mailboxes. Well, one Saturday morning, I woke up and my mailbox was smashed in on the ground. So <laughs> what I did, and, I, and I, rumor was it was Nate and his hay rubes, Nate and his group, his, his groupies going around after a football game, smashing mailboxes. So they always targeted mine because it was out in the middle of nowhere. It was out in the country, about uh, three miles north of the city, out in the country. So nobody, you know, there's no police around or anything. So they kept doing it. So what I did eventually, they smashed, I got a replacement, and they smashed that one. Then I got a metal one on a 4x4 four four post. They blew that one up with like an M80 firecracker. It just exploded it. <laughs> <laughs> so finally, what I did was, I got a oversized metal mailbox, one of the supersized ones that you can put UPS packages in, bolted it to the top of a four by four, concreted it into the ground, and I took the, I took a coffee can 
stuck it in the middle of the mailbox, poured concrete around the outside. So it was a, it was like that size, but concreted around in the oversized portion of the mailbox. So it was a mailbox within a mailbox, a concrete bunker for my mail. And I thought maybe those guys are going to learn something. If they try to smash that thing with, the, you're going to come in, you know, somebody's going to, you know, they're going to have to, you know, they're not going to do that again. So, <laughs> but what I found out the next Saturday morning when I woke up, they'd actually, uh, <laughs> some Jerry rigged some kind of mega bomb. They threw it in my mailbox. And when I woke up the next morning, my mailbox was intact, but they had blown a hole through the back of my mailbox. Through, the part that I didn't reinforce with the concrete. So it actually blew a hole through my mailbox and, and ruined that. So I went to the pastor the next Monday morning and staffed me. I said, what am I supposed to do? Well, he said, it's your problem. You've got to figure it out. You've got to figure this one out on your own. So anyway, do we have problems like this in, in ministry? What are, you, what are you supposed to do when the very people, right, who you're trying to reach out to with the message reject your message, and they reject you. you know? This is, yeah, this is the situation that Jeremiah's in. So, so welcome to the life of a prophet. So, let's see. Um, so, we, we move on, and we'll cover, you know, we're not going to cover all the jots and tittles, but chapter 21 through 24, Jeremiah's going to bring some charges against those kings. There's a lot of charges there in details against the various kings that were active during the reign, the prophetic ministry of Jeremiah. He's got some words to say against Zedekiah uh, uh, in chapter 21. He's going to have some kings against King Jeho Ahaz, or a.k.a. Shalom, who was taken to Egypt and will never return. Chapter 22, um, in the rest of Jeremiah 22, he's got accusations against the kings that came before King Zedekiah, First Jehoiakim and then Jehoiachin. So that's chapter 22. And all of these kings, according to Jeremiah the prophet, will fail. So this is all the kings that come after King Josiah leading into the eventual demise of Judah and the capital city of Jerusalem. All kings will fail except for one. And that's what we see in the next section here. Chapter 23. Let's take a look. And then he says in chapter 23, verse 1, Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who are tending my people. You have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not attended to them. Behold, I am about to attend to you for the evil of your deeds, declares the Lord. Then I myself shall gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I've driven them, shall bring them back to their pasture, and then they'll be fruitful and multiply. So there we come right back to the message of restoration. When the Lord comes back to be king, he'll also be shepherd and bring the blessings and restore. He'll, he'll fill, that, fill out that role of the shepherd over the people. It's interesting, Jesus uses some of that same language, doesn't he? Being the good shepherd recognizing that's you know this is this anticipation of the king who's coming and um, verse uh, chapter 23 verse 3 through 8 um, and he'll raise up verse 4 I will raise up shepherds over them and they will tend them they will not be afraid any longer nor be terrified nor will any be missing declares the Lord behold the days are coming now we're getting back to this day of the Lord anticipation when I shall raise up for David a righteous branch and he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved. Israel will dwell securely. And this is his name by which he shall be called. The Lord is our righteousness. So this now, we have the fullness of the anticipation of the Davidic covenant coming into Jeremiah's message. And uh, he's coming from this uh, righteous branch of, of David. And that was all part of the Davidic covenant that we saw. Let's keep going here. Jeremiah's going to charge and preach against the false prophets. So chapter 23, the rest of it, there has some passages that rail against these dudes here who can't see and are trying to lead the people but are misleading them. Chapter 23, verse 16. 
Thus says the Lord of hosts, do not listen to the words of the prophets who are prophesying to you. They are leading you into futility. Back to that vanity idea. They speak a vision of their own imagination from the mouth, not from the mouth of the Lord. They keep saying to those who despise me, the Lord has said you will have peace. That's what they're saying, but it's a false message. And as everyone who walks in the stubbornness of his own heart, they will say, Calamity will not come upon you, but who has stood in the counsel of the Lord that he should see and hear his word? So they're giving a false message of you know, promising, oh, maybe they're saying, these false prophets, hey, the Lord's covenantally obligated to always protect us. He's got our back. Don't worry about a thing. We're fine. Spiritual pride, right? Um, but that's not the case, and Jeremiah knows the uh, flip side to that. Finally, Jeremiah is prophesying specific details with regards to the coming exile for Judah. Chapter 25, beginning in verse 8. Let's see, I'm going to have somebody else read. Bridget, why don't you read over here in a real mean voice? Okay. I'm just kidding. Probably do better than Ben back here, that's for sure. Oh, I can't believe I said that. Yeah. I was like, you're not coming back. Okay. Chapter. Chapter, I'm sorry, chapter 25, verse 8 through 11. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not obeyed my word, behold, I will send for all the tribes of the north, declares the Lord, and for Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and I will bring them against this land and its inhabitants and against all these surrounding nations. I will devote them to destruction and make them a horror, a hissing, and a, an everlasting desolation. Moreover, I will banish from them the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the grinding of the millstones and the light of the lamp. This whole land shall become a ruin and a waste, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon seventy years. Okay, so now finally we have, with this intense message of judgment, and here we have lots of language that seems to take away the joy, take away the light, take away the blessing, take away the bounty, and all of these things that get taken away. When the Babylonians under King Nebuchadnezzar come down, the land will be a desolation and a horror, but for 70 years. So Babylon will have a period of time, and eventually they'll have their day in, in judgment. Eventually they will be taken over by the, the Persians, and we'll get to that later. But 70, uh, really the, there's scholarly debate about that number. Um, Technically, by the time this, the date of this prophecy was probably delivered in about 605 BC to the actual fall of the Babylonians at the hands of the Persians in 539, that's about 66 years. So scholars talk about that. And, uh, I think it's probably a, a round figure. You know, the idea of seven is this idea of completion, the biblical sense, sometimes perfection. So 70 represents a period of fullness or completion. So at the completion of this time of being in exile, 70 years is, is kind of a roundup. And uh, that's when we're going to see things start to turn around. So this is the beginning of hope. Daniel, when we get to Daniel, <clears throat> Daniel's also going to build on this prophecy of Jeremiah. The 70 years will become significant for Jerem um, sorry, Daniel in chapter 9, verse 2. He's also going to be encouraging the exiles with this message of 70. In other words, it's going to have a, we're only going to be here for a time, and then the Lord will act and allow us to go back. And there it's going to be, the precipitating event will be also the addition that we'll see is the Cyrus decree. So the Persian king Cyrus and his decree that will allow the exiles to come back. So this is where we're going with this. And this would have been an encouraging word in a, if Jeremiah is speaking to you, right over here, you four, the righteous remnant, this is good news for you because this is an end to the, to the exilic experience. It's going to have an end. It's not forever. So that's, that's good, and that's hope for the future. Jeremiah chapter 26. Uh, this begins a section that um, is really focusing now uh, on a particular phase in the prophet Jeremiah's ministry. Um, he's on trial for his message because he's basically been saying 
over and over again, Jerusalem's going to fall. And uh, as we've seen, this, this message would have been understood clearly as a message of treason. Let's look at Jeremiah 26, verse 7. And uh, let's have uh, Ian in the back. Could you read that? Down through 11, 7 through 11 in chapter 26. The priests and the prophets and all the people heard Jeremiah speaking these words in the house of the Lord. And when Jeremiah had finished speaking all that the Lord had commanded him to speak to all the people, then the priests and the prophets and all the people laid hold of him, saying, You shall die. What have you prophesied in the name of the Lord, saying, This house shall be like Shiloh, and this city shall be desolate without inhabitant? And all the people gathered around Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. When the officials of Judah heard these things, they came up from the king's house to the house of the Lord, and took their seat in the entry of the new gate of the house of the Lord. Then the priests and the prophets said to the officials and to all the people, This man deserves a sen sentence of death. Because he has prophesied against the city, as you have heard with your own ears. So we see a little bit of some, you know, this this kind of, well, what happens here is this kind of escalates. Verse 16, we see some intervention. Then the officials and all the people said to the priest and to the prophets, No death sentence for this man, for he has spoken to us in the name of the Lord our God. And we go down to verse 24. But the hand, uh, the hand of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, was with Jeremiah, so that he was not given into the hands of the people to put him to death. So this was a close call, this whole section here with regards to Jeremiah. Almost, almost loses his life here, um, thankfully. And we see evidence of Jeremiah's concern for the exiles. Now in, uh, we move to chapter 29. And this is a unique, uh, like I said before, a, a phase in Jeremiah's ministry where he's you know he's reaching out now to the exiles in a particular way um, chapter 29 um, and let's read a little bit of this here Let's see Kristen have I asked you to read yet no. chapter 29 start reading there in verse one well, let's let's do this not the I want you to start reading there I actually want you to start reading in verse four um, what, what you need to know is chapter 29, verse 1, all the way down through verse 32. This whole chapter was written and intended for the exiles in Babylon. So by the, by the time we get to chapter 29, Jerusalem's fallen. The exiles have gone to Babylon. Now the prophet Jeremiah is back in Jerusalem, writing as a means of encouraging them. So you see in verse 1, now these are the words of the letter it's actually written down in a letter which Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the rest of the elders of the exiles, the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. So that's kind of the header that gives us uh, where the letter is going. Now let's start in verse 4 down through verse 7. Kristen. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. <clears throat> Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for, uh, for your sons and give your daughters in marriage, that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply theirs and, uh, and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you to exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for it is welfare. Uh, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. Okay. So that welfare word, uh, the word there is the word peace or shalom. Um, so what's interesting here is the prophets encouraging the exiles who are asking the question, what do we do now? What are we supposed to do? Well, he's saying, well, the Babylonians are allowing you to remain together as a people while you're there. Go ahead and build houses, live in them, have kids, plant gardens, eat their fruit, take wives, have sons and daughters, raise your families. Um, and while you're there, pray for the shalom of the city where you've been sent into exile and pray that Yahweh, for in it, uh, pray for the, the city will have shalom or peace and that you'll have peace while you're there. In other words, get on to living your life while you're in exile. Be the covenant people that God's called you to be. And after 70 years, something will happen to allow you to come back. So this was God's plan A. This was Jeremiah's message to the Faithful remnant, by the way, you'll go there too. And when you go there, this will be your experience. Don't give up. God's not giving up on you. Uh, stay faithful, in other words. 
um, which is an interesting. And this is a, a little glimpse into the to the life of the exiles. We don't really have a lot of windows into it. We'll get into it when we get to Jeremiah. Uh, I'm sorry, Ezekiel. But chapter 29, if we move down to verse 10, we see ongoing encouragement. The prophet Jeremiah says, For thus says the Lord, verse 10, When 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I'll visit you and fulfill my good word to you and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare, not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Then you'll call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart, and I will be found by you, declares the Lord. I will restore your fortunes, gather you from all the nations, from all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from where I sent you into exile. Sounds like Deuteronomy chapter 30 all over again. But God's not, not, God's not moved away from his, his message. He's laid out the theology of exile. He gave it to Moses, and it's not changed. So it's just a, you know, a time. What's going to happen in exile? One of the additional benefits is for you, that is, the majority of unfaithful. You or a lot of you will repent, and your hearts will be strangely warmed. And you'll move over to this group, and by the time... Ezekiel gets done ministering to you, there'll be a large group of everyone that will have this desire and an inner desire to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the covenant community. But it's only after the exile gets your attention will this happen, see? So that's where we're going with this. I got a question. Yeah. Probably a stupid one, but... Yeah, I'm sure it is. <laughs> Hopefully, it's, it's harsh tonight. I'm sorry. I'm just gonna... Trustees are here this week. All the rights, like they would have, you know, because we know that some exiles chose to stay is to set Yes. Back. So, mm -hmm. was it were they really persecuted that much? Like they weren't slaves. Right? Well, the Babylonians, they were, they were uh, bringing in people groups like conquered nations, like that they had done with with Jerusalem and, and Judah, um, and setting them up so that they could remain intact, unlike the Assyrians that basically, you know, totally assimilated them. They would remain intact, but then they'd be given jobs and they'd have certain roles, kind of like Joseph in Egypt. Some of them rose to prominent positions. We'll get into Daniel's situation. He's an example of someone who is a Hebrew who rises with some pretty significant prominence, kind of like Joseph. So he'll, he'll be our, our Joseph in Babylon, soon to be Persia. He'll be instrumental behind the scenes. So we... And in some cases, some of the exiles choose not to go back. When we get to the, uh, we won't get to Esther, but that story is all about some who stay back and don't don't go home. They hear about, you know, so. But they're used by God behind the scenes, just like we see with, with Daniel and the lion's den and some of these miraculous events that take place to get the attention of these Persian kings to then issue these decrees to allow the exiles to go back on friendly terms, so. So yes, they they're not they're they're servants. They're they're they become part of the the economy uh, of of Babylon at that time. So, all right. So mentioned Ezekiel. Ezekiel's gonna also like Jeremiah and what we see here in chapter twenty nine. He's gonna be also the prophet whom God raises up to minister to this group of exiles. And so we'll see some similar words of encouragement coming from both of these prophets. Um, so Jeremiah is going to do his part. Um, chapter 29, um, this letter, what Jeremiah will do is add to this what's called the Book of Consolation, which represents chapter 30, verse 1, all the way through chapter 33, verse 26. So this whole book, this book within the book, chapter 30 through 33 in Jeremiah is called the Book of Consolation. It's really with the letter, like the cover letter, tw chapter 29, is all intended to go and encourage um, the faithful remnant who are in exile. And they needed to be encouraged, like I've been saying all along. What is God's long-term plan for us? We're here for 70 years, but what are we supposed to do in the meantime? And uh, that's the picture that Jeremiah begins to paint. And for the faithful remnant, Jeremiah is going to encourage them with this better, basic message that better days are ahead for those who endure the exile. Let's take a look at chapter 30, verse 1 through 3. 
And uh, let's have uh, Kelsey. Could you read for us? Chapter 30, verse 1 through 3. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, write in a book all the words that I have spoken to you. That's the book of consolation. Go ahead. For behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will restore the fortunes of my people, Israel and Judah, says the Lord, and I will bring them back to the land that I gave their fathers, and they shall take possession of it. Let's skip down to verse 8 and 9. Keep reading. And it shall come to pass in that day, declares the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off your neck, and I will burst your bonds, and the foreigners shall no more make a servant of him. But they shall serve the Lord their God, and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. So now we get back to some of those everlasting promises of the Davidic covenant, promises that through David and his line will emerge a king who will reign and establish this new kingdom of peace and Prosperity for the people, the restored Israel, Judah and Jerusalem, Judah and Israel coming back, and all of these things that we've seen. Now, central to this book of consolation is chapter 31, and we want to focus a little bit of time over here on this is the new covenant in Jeremiah. And again, a lot of these passages, these little mini messages, start with the whole days are coming. This is a reference to the coming day of the Lord. So this is this idea of future when the Messiah is coming. He's come once, but he's coming again. Behold, verse 27, actually down to verse 31. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them up out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke... Although I was a husband to them, so technically there wasn't a certificate of divorce, but they walked away and walked out of the marriage, declares the Lord. But verse 33, but this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my Torah within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So it's a new day. It's a day when... It seems as if this, this day, well, we will not have our roles confused. Our role as, you know, this name change of Hosea, the day when our name goes from lo Ami to Ami. You are my people, you know, and um, we, will, we will be in the, the freedom and the fullness of being there on the day with the reigning king, this new reigning king, this, this from the messianic line of King David. Look over in chapter 30. 3, verse 14 through 17. Chapter 33, verse 14 through 17. And uh, let's see here. Michael in the front here, could you read for us? Chapter 33, beginning in verse 14. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel. And the house of Judah. In those days, and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up from David. You shall uh, you justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved in Jerusalem. And this is the name on which it will be called the Lord uh, is our righteousness. Uh, for this says the Lord, David shall never let the man who sit on the throne in the house of Israel. Okay, so it's the Davidic covenant, the righteous branch of David. The Messiah is coming who will reign and establish his kingdom and will reign as king. Um, and if there's anybody who's skeptical about this, I don't know if this is really going to happen. How's God going to pull this off kind of person in the, uh, you know, think of the Muppets, those two old men that sit up always, you know, they're hounding the, you know, everything. There's uh, Anyway, chapter 33, uh, we see in verse 19. And the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, If you can break my covenant for the day and my covenant for the night, so that day and night will not be at their appointed time, well, if you can do that, then my covenant may also be broken with David my servant, that he shall not have a son to reign on his throne and with the Levitical priests, my ministers. But here's what I say. 
as the host of heaven cannot be counted and the sand of the sea cannot be measured, so I will multiply the descendants of David my servant and the Levites who minister to me. And the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, Have you not observed what the people have spoken saying? Um, the two families which the Lord chose, has he rejected them? Thus they despise my people no longer. Um, no longer are they as a nation in their sight. Thus says the Lord, If my covenant for day and night shall not stand in the fixed patterns of heaven and earth, I have not established, then I would reject the descendants of Jacob and David my servant, not taking from his descendants rulers over the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but I will restore their fortunes and will have mercy on them. So, hey, if you can go up and change the patterns of the stars and rearrange the motions of the sun and the moon and all those things that are fixed, because I ordained them from the beginning, if you can change all that, then go have your skeptical your skepticism about my ability and my willingness to follow through with my end of the deal. This is the Lord speaking. In other words, this is going to happen. So he's, again, just like Abraham. Hey, you're doubting me? Go out and count the stars. Let's do this one more time, you know? Israel, Judah. Now, if you have any doubts, go up and count the stars. Have your star party and remind yourself one more time that I, the Lord, will act and I'm acting on behalf of who I am the unchanging God, the creator of the universe. So we get back to these everlasting promises. All right, let's see. So after the book of Consolation, the scene returns to the chaos back in Jerusalem. So chapter 34, um, verse 1 through chapter 36, verse 32. And this is the part that's not following the strict chronology. Somebody pointed out earlier, so starting in this section, uh, Jeremiah is again going to refer back to kings and activities with regards to Zedekiah, who refuses to listen to the words of the Lord, and Jehoiakim, who burns the scroll. That's the burning of the scroll section. We won't cover that, but Jeremiah is going to speak words, write them down on the scroll, and in an act of defiance, the king Jehoiakim burns the scroll um, in defiance. But this is all covered in this section. So it's kind of a kind of a revert back to things that we've events that have already occurred. Beginning in chapter 37, let's look uh, look at verse 1. You know, and you see a reference back to Zedekiah, who's wanting to... Uh, be, we're really beginning in chapter 37, verse 1, all the way up through chapter 39. We are really in the last days again of Judah, right up and just before the fall of Jerusalem in 586. Jeremiah, during this time, and with kings like Zedekiah, he's going to warn against, we cannot trust in the Egyptians to save us. Uh, and with this message in chapter 37, we see it here in verse 11. Jeremiah is going to be imprisoned. Now it happened when the army of the Babylonians had lifted the siege from Jerusalem because of Pharaoh's army, that Jeremiah went out from Jerusalem to go to the land of Benjamin in order to take possession of some property there among the people. While he was at the gate of Benjamin, a captain of the guard, whose name was um, Erijah, the son of uh, Shelemiah, the son of Hananiah, was there. And he arrested Jeremiah the prophet, saying, you are, you are going over to the Chaldeans or the Babylonians. But Jeremiah said, a lie. I'm not going over to the Chaldeans or the Babylonians. Yet he would not listen to him. So Erijah arrested Jeremiah and brought him to the officials. Then the officials were angry at Jeremiah and beat him. And they put him in jail in the house of uh, J uh, Jonathan, the scribe, uh, which they had made into uh, the prison. For Jeremiah had come into the dungeon, that is, the vaulted cell, and Jeremiah stayed there for many days. So he's getting himself in trouble again because it's not about trusting in the Egyptians. The Babylonians are poised to take possession of Jer Jerusalem with the siege, the siege that's going on. Um, but we see that what ends up happening is Jeremiah ends up at the bottom of a cistern for preaching this message of treason. And in chapter 38, verses 1 through 6. Let's see here. Let's go back to you, Tad. Chapter 30, 38, 1 through 6 there. Now, Shephatiah, son of Matthias, Shep Shep son of Pashur, Yehukal, son of Salamiah, and Pashur. Get an A for the day. 
heard what Jeremiah had been telling the people. He had been saying, This is what the Lord says. Everyone who stays in Jerusalem will die from war, famine, or disease, but those who surrender to the Babylonians will live. Their reward will be life. They will live. The Lord also says, The city of Jerusalem will certainly be handed over to the army of the king of Babylon who will capture it. See, that's treason right there. You know, he's staying true to that message, but keep going. What happens to Jeremiah? Verse 4. So these officials went to the king and said, Sir, this man must die. What kind of thought will undermine the morale of the few fighting men we have left? As well as that of all the people, this man is a traitor. King Zedekiah agreed. All right, he said, do as you like. I can't stop you. So the officials took Jeremiah from his cell and lowered him by rope to an empty cistern in the prison yard. If he were belonged to Malkajah, a member of the royal family, there was no water in the cistern, but there was a thick layer of mud at the bottom, and Jeremiah sank down into it. Yeah. Have you ever felt like that in ministry? You're in the bottom of a cistern. It's not just any old cistern. It barely has any water in it, which isn't very helpful. But it's got enough mud in it that you start sinking. It's the worst kind of cistern. So this is where Jeremiah is with preaching his message. Um, you know, he's staying true to his message. And finally, in chapter 39, uh, we see the aftermath of what's going on with the Babylonians who are outside. Now, it came about when... Jerusalem was captured in the ninth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah. In the tenth month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army came to Jerusalem and laid siege to it. In the eleventh year of Zedekiah, in the fourth month, in the ninth day of the month, the city wall was breached. And then that was the end. So that, that's when we find the last group of exiles, those who are seemingly thinking that they're going to be safe in the walled cities of Jerusalem end up going into um, Babylonian exile. And unfortunately, we see the aftermath for Zedekiah in verse 5. And this is how you take care of an opposing, potentially opposing dynasty. You don't want any surviving uh, lineage to take over the, the monarchy after you've defeated you know, the opposing king. The army of the Babylonians pursued them and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho, and they seized him, brought him up to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon at Riblah, in the land of Hamath, and passed sentence on him. Then the king of Babylon slew the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes at Riblah. The king of Babylon also slew all the nobles of Judah, and then he blinded Zedekiah's eyes and bound him in fetters of bronze to bring him to Babylon. Babylon, And that's how you utterly humiliate and Render helpless a king and defeat him. Blind him and take care of all possible successors, or seemingly we think all possible successors. Are. So that's uh, seemingly the end of the situation. And Jeremiah, um, in chapter 39, we see what's going to happen next to, to him in verse 9 and 10. So after this, as for the rest of the people in chapter 39 who were left in the city, the deserters who had gone over to him and the rest of the people who remained, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the bodyguard, carried them into exile in Babylon. But, but some of the poorest of the poor who had nothing, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the bodyguard, left behind in the land of Judah and gave them vineyards and fields at that time. Jeremiah is going to be spared. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, gave orders about Jeremiah through Nebuzaradan, the captain of the bodyguard, saying, Take him, look after him. Do nothing harmful to him, but rather deal with him uh, just as he tells you. It's interesting. Jeremiah is going to stay back to minister to this group, the poorest of the poor, the, the leftovers of exile back in Jerusalem. And he's going to find favor with King Nebuchadnezzar because, you know, he's, he's, he's getting better treatment from this pagan king than his own king. Um, so Jeremiah is going to stay back. Jeremiah chooses to stay and minister to this group. Verse 13. Um, let's start in verse 14. They even sent and took Jeremiah out of the court of the guardhouse and entrusted him to Gedaliah, who's going to be the appointed governor by the Babylonians to look over things. Um, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, to take him home, so he stayed among the people. 
Now the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah while he was confined in the court of the guardhouse, saying, so now he's got this ongoing prophetic ministry to the poorest to the poor who are back in Jerusalem. Um, so we'll pick up and almost finish Jeremiah. I'm just a couple slides away with uh, a little bit of Jeremiah's message to this group. The poorest of the poor, the leftovers in the exile, of the exile back in, in Jerusalem. And eventually what ends up happening where they hogtie him and kidnap him and take him to Egypt of all places. And he continues his prophetic ministry there. So he's a prophet who's like the Energizer bunny. He just keeps on ticking. No matter what happens to him, his ministry is to the, the people that God calls him to minister to, despite his circumstances. All right, well, good job tonight, everyone. Sorry if I picked on you too much.